if you think of the word resonance, you've probably heard of it outside of physics context. Maybe if you're listening to someone speak, they're presenting an argument, and that argument really agrees with you, we say it resonates with you. So to resonate is to agree. In terms of waves, we say when an object is caused to vibrate at one of its natural frequencies, it resonates with it. All objects have these natural frequencies at which they want to vibrate at. If you cause it to happen, it will pick up or agree with that frequency. This causes the energy involved with the wave to be accepted very, very easily. You can just sort of feed energy into the medium because it already wants to vibrate at this frequency. This causes the amplitude to increase. If we're talking about sound waves, well, the amplitude determines the volume. That means the sound is going to get louder. This also creates standing waves. You notice we're using some of the same vocabulary. Standing waves are created when you activate one of these natural frequencies. That means really that the medium is resonating with it. A lot of musical instruments are played with strings. And so when we had talked we talked about the standing waves on a string, we say that the string is resonating with it, causing those different harmonics. Again, those are vocabulary terms used talking about chords and frequencies that agree with each other in music, creating harmonious sounds. Other musical instruments are based on series of tubes. So now we're going to look at resonance in tubes. There are two main types of tubes we can be looking at, either tubes that are open on both ends, called open-open, or tubes that are open on one end, closed on the other, called open-closed. Let's focus on the open-open tube first. We'll define capital L as the length of the tube, and we're going to start to draw pictures of what the standing waves look like once the air inside the tube is resonating. An end that's open to the air is free to move, and so it's going to vibrate the largest amplitude, so it's going to be an antidote there. We want to try to draw the shortest wavelength for the smallest number of cycles in this first tube here. And so it's going to have an antinode on one end and an antinode on the other. We have the node in the middle. So it looks sort of like this. This is not really what the standing wave looks like. This is really a picture of what the, the vibrations look like. The a largest vibration near this end, a largest vibration near this end, and no vibrations in the middle. So it's almost like a, a graph of the vibrations of the air inside, but it's going to help us visualize it because now we can relate it to the same sort of pictures we would draw for standing waves in a string. If we're imagining it like a string, then it would oscillate back and forth, back and forth. And again, just it's not exactly what's happening, but it's going to help us visualize what's going on here. This is what the next standing wave would look like. We're trying to fit more cycles inside, but we still have to have the same rule that an uh, end open to the air is going to have an antinode. So I have an antinode here, antinode here. We have to have another antinode in the middle. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video and try to draw the next standing wave in the third tube here, trying to get the smallest wavelength in there, but still putting more cycles in. So following the rule that we have to have an antinode here and an antinode here, hopefully you drew something that looks like this. Antinode Antinode. Notice that it keeps switching which position it's at. It started an antinode at the bottom, antinode at the top, and now we go back to an antinode at the bottom. And again, imagining it to look like a wave in a string, it would oscillate back and forth, back and forth. Now let's talk about this in terms of how many cycles are fit into each of these tubes. We should be able to see that for the first tube, this is half a cycle. It goes from crest down to trough. That's not a full cycle, that's half a cycle. Why don't you go ahead and figure out what the number of cycles are for the second and third tubes, write them down, and then see what I show you. For the second one, we should see it's a full cycle. We go from crest down to trough back to crest. That is a full cycle. It's not the way we traditionally look at it, perhaps on a wave on a string, but certainly it's a full cycle or two half wavelengths. And for the third one, we should see it's three half wavelengths. Crest, trough, crest, trough, like so. So in this case, it goes a full cycle, an extra half. And we should notice that every time we go to another standing wave, another resonance, we add in another half a cycle, another half a wavelength, very similar to what we saw for the waves on the string. So we can write the same equation, L equals N over 2 times lambda. We're going to go through the same sort of derivation, getting an equation for the frequencies. In this case, lambda equals 2L over N, and V equals F lambda. Putting it all together, we're going to get V equals F times 2L over N. And then we can rearrange this for F. This is Fn equals NV over 2L. Well, notice this is the exact same equation as we saw for the standing waves on a string, because if you compare the fact that here it always has to be antinode, antinode, and for the waves on a string fixed on both ends, it had to be node, node, we should recognize we should be getting the same sort of equation. Fn, again, is the frequency of the nth harmonic. And in this case, n is an integer, n equals 1, 2, 3. That's the same thing as it is for waves on a string. We are once again going to call the lowest frequency there the fundamental. 
and this ends up being twice the fundamental, this ends up being three times the fundamental, so we see the same sort of relationships there, that the frequency is always n times the fundamental, where n is this integer, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Now let's look at the open-closed tube. Again, we'll define capital L as the length of the tube. Now we have a bit of a different situation. The n that's open to the air, again, will be an antinode, but the n that's closed has to be a node. So why don't you pause the video and see if you can draw the shortest wavelength, the smallest number of cycles that'll fit in this first one, where this n has to be a node, this n has to be an antinode. It should look like this, a node here, an antinode there. Maybe if you put an equilibrium line down the middle, it might help you out, or imagining it like a wave on a string oscillating back and forth, back and forth. It's got to be here at the equilibrium position, and here has to be the largest position away from equilibrium. This is what the next one should look like. A node here, an antinode here. Again, trying to fit as few cycles in as possible, but still following the rules. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can draw the third one, following the same rules. Hopefully you do something like this. Node here, Antinode here. Notice again the position of the antinode keeps switching. Here it is at the top, here it is at the bottom, here it is at the top. And again, imagining it to be like a wave on a string, it would be oscillating back and forth, back and forth, so on. So here we're going to try to play the same game, figure out how many waves are going to fit in each of these tubes. You should be able to see that the first one is a quarter of a cycle, or a quarter of the wavelength, going from the node up to the antinode, or we're going from equilibrium up to crest. If this was here, this would be half of this, since this is half of the wavelength, it's a half of the half, this is a quarter, right? So in this case, there's a quarter wavelength fitting in the first tube. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out how many cycles are fitting in the second and the third tubes. For the second one, you should be able to see it's three quarters of a wavelength. Quarter, half, three quarters. For the third one, you should see it's five quarters of a wavelength. Quarter, half, three quarter, full, and one extra quarter wavelength. But notice that the difference is always half a wavelength. That's going to be the same no matter what sort of standing wave, no matter what sort of resonance you're looking at. Between harmonics, it's always going to be a half a wavelength or half a cycle that fits in. So this time we can write L equals N over 4 times lambda, or lambda equals 4L over N. Combining this with V equals F lambda, we're going to get V equals F times 4L over N. And now when we solve this for the frequency of the nth harmonic, it's NV over 4L. So we'll box this in as the equation for the frequencies in an open closed tube. Now n, while it's still an integer, is not going to have all of the numbers that it was here. It's 1, 3, 5. So in this case, it's only the odd harmonics that are present in an open closed tube. The smallest frequency is still the fundamental, but since n can only be the odd numbers, this next one is 3 times the fundamental, this next one is 5 times the fundamental. Only the odd harmonics, again, are present in the open-closed tube, as opposed to the open-open, where all of the harmonics are present.